Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 299 for Monday, April 5th, 2021. <music> Greetings, folks. And welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here, as always, in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, Paul Kent. And, uh, well, first I'll ask you, Paul, how you doing? Yo, good, man. Good, good. Uh, we are not alone today. It's, 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 um, it's a COVID miracle. We, today we have uh, David Jameson joining us. Uh, David makes a product called Gig Performer. David is also a gig performer and is a keyboard player who has played with many, many people that uh, that we as musicians know. He plays in a few tribute bands with people that uh, that have quite some uh, some notoriety and and he's got chops. So we are very, very happy to have you here. Thanks for joining us today, David. It is absolutely my pleasure. Welcome. <laughs> cool. All right, so I, I want to talk about gig performer, but first let's let's get people interested in in you. And so I, I want to you're you have sort of almost stumbled into this uh, segment of your career where you're playing with various uh, sort of high profile tribute acts. You play with three that I know of, and maybe there's more. You play with a Peter Gabriel tribute called Security Project. You play with Reelin' in the Years, a Steely Dan tribute, and you play or have played with Beyond the Wall, a Pink Floyd tribute. Did I did I get them all? You did, and in fact, that band is going to be doing a live stream from Daryl's house in May. Uh, that just happened the other day. No, so which which ba back. which band is is coming live from oh, Daryl's house? Beyond the Wall, our Pink Floyd. No, uh, we're doing Daryl's house on May sixteenth. I think. What I heard was they are allowing 40 people onto the premises and then they will live stream and people can either watch free or pay a bit of money to help starving musicians and so on. Yeah, that but that just happened uh, about two weeks ago. That got scheduled. Congratulations. And David, are all of those bands um, New York-based musicians? We were talking before that you're, you were in New York. You're not in New York now. So I'm just curious what the connection is. Have you been in touch with these bands, rehearsing with these bands through the pandemic? Rehearsal? What's that? <laughs> um, so, so um, well, uh, Security Project, which um, uh, is the Peter Gabriel tribute band. Um, so Jerry, Jerry Morata, who's the drummer, uh, he's up in Woodstock, uh, which is the same distance for me here as it was for me in New York, just mm -hmm. in a different direction. Um, Trey Gunn, uh, who plays um, touch guitar. He lives in Seattle, Washington. Um, Michael Kotze, who's the guitarist in that band, lives in um, Seattle, Washington. Um, in fact, I think Trey found Michael and brought Michael into the band. They knew each other. Um, Happy Rhodes lives somewhere Edmonton or I don't know, somewhere way up north in New York City, like four hours away from New York City or or more. Mm -hmm. So it's very spread out. Um, and, you know, when that band rehearses, they kind of they come together for like, you know, a couple of days um, before they leave on tour. And I love that. Everybody yeah. has learned the music already. So the rehearsals are just about, OK, do we go around this verse twice or three times as opposed to, no, you should be playing a G sharp there. Yes. Yeah. And you know, so what you just shared is what every single person who listens to this show that has been separated from their band that kind of wants to get back together and get ready to get out there and start playing again. Everybody is, is doing that. They're saying, okay, you guys, we're going to get together, learn your stuff, come in, we'll dust it off and, and, you know, we'll make sure we're on the same page, but this is not going to be six months of rehearsals to get us back up. Well, back there's up a, speed. there's a difference between learning the music and rehearsing the music. And, and what you described, David is rehearsing the music. You're, you're just, you're arranging it and making sure everybody's on the same page, which is great. Right. But you know, while struggling to get bands together before I fell into these particular situations, um, you know, you, you get together a bunch of local musicians in the area 
And then you end up playing in the basement for six months and everybody shows up and they haven't practiced the song. So you're sitting there while people are basically learning them. And it's like you're sitting there. It's a G, not a G flat. You know, yeah. it's you know, it's a C major chord, not an A minor sixth or whatever it is. Yeah. It's like, and I, I grew very frustrated with that, with that process. And what I've loved about um, all three bands um, that I'm in is basically when we do a rehearsal, everybody knows their parts and it's really just about, okay, let's run through and um, yeah, you know, maybe the bass should be a little louder here, or maybe the keyboard should do this here, but nobody's saying you're playing the wrong chords or yeah. you're, you're doing it wrong. And none of that, which I love. That's the real that's in awesome. the years band, which I fell into as well. I got no rehearsals at all. I showed up for the first gig. <laughs> So, yeah, so tell, so I, I I want you to tell this story, and I've I full disclosure I've I've heard this story because you told it to me when we when we first met. But you took over for Pete Levin in that band, is that right? Yeah. Pete Pete Levin being the brother of Tony Levin, wow, and the, that's right. the only one of the Levin brothers I've ever played with. I sat on stage with him and played with my old drum teacher uh, on my old drum teacher's kit, but. Uh, Cool. But, well, yeah, but so how, like, how did that happen? <laughs> Pete, 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 Pete's an amazing um, um, jazz keyboard player. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't hope to play uh, the way he does. So what happened was, you know, I knew Jerry from Security Project. Jer Jerry all... Murata, longtime Steely Dan drummer. Well, and Peter Gabriel. No, drummer. no, no, no. That's his brother, oh, Rick. Rick Murata was a Steely Dan drummer. That's correct. Oh, well, I, I was going to I, I gonna ask I, this question about Jerry Murata. It's it's that Jerry Murata who, who was with Peter Gabriel and Hall and, he's on the Hall and Oates records. That's and right. Correct. Indigo yeah, Girls. Yes. And yeah. Wow. Yes. Yes. That Jerry Murata. That Jerry uh, Murata. Uh, yes. That was a, 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 a folding in with that crowd. Talk about intimidation. <laughs> that was a, that, there's a few stories there too. But what happened was, so, you know, I know Jerry well, obviously I discovered he had this, Steely Dan tribute band. I didn't even know they were playing up in Schenectady. So I drove up just one summer, a few summers ago, to just hear them. And then I said to Jerry, I said, "Hey, you know, if you ever need a sub keyboard player, you know, if Pete can't do a show, I'd love to do it." So Jerry says to me, "Well, you know, learn the songs. Here's the list, and you know, maybe it'll happen." I said, okay, I went off and learned basically twenty two, twenty two um, Steely Dan. Songs. I mean, and I'm really trying to capture the dawn, which you know, with the with the appropriate plugins and the appropriate, you know, phasers, you know, you could get that sound. So I learned them, and then about uh, that would have been like June, July, then sometime around October, um, I got a call. He said, uh, "Any chance you might be available to play a show in December in Woodstock?" I said, sure, happy to. I've learned the stuff. I'll review it. I said, when's the rehearsal? And Jerry said, oh, we'll set up a rehearsal with the main guys um, sometime over the next month or so. so. Great. So I'm going through, playing over and over again, you know, make sure, um, you know, I know them. There's a great line I heard many years ago. What's the difference between an amateur musician and a professional musician? I, I, an, an amateur musician practices so that he doesn't make mistakes or she, I don't mean to be gender, um, right? A professional musician rehearses so that he can't make mistakes. Ah. Uh, somebody told me that many years ago. That's a good one. And, and I will tell you, honestly, I was on tour in Europe with Security Project when my mother died uh, while I was on tour. And, I, you know, the show goes on. I'm playing the show thinking about having to get back to Ireland for the funeral and stuff. And I'm just playing, you know, you're not thinking, you know, you just do yeah. it. So you get to know it that well. Mm. Um, so anyway, so I've learned all this stuff. So I, I knew it. I said, Jerry, when's the rehearsal? I said, it's over. I'm working on it. <laughs> Jerry, gets closer and closer. And Famous closer. last words. I'm working on it. I'll yeah, let you know. Yeah. So Checks next the thing, the day shows up. I just drove up to Woodstock, take out my gear to go to a sound check. We do one song. We did the show. Then at the end of the show, somebody comes. Up, somebody came up to me and said, um, "Okay, um, Pete left the band three days ago. You're it." <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so you, you, you thought you were subbing that night, but really what you were doing was sort of a, almost a, from their standpoint, a desperate <laughs> audition. Like, let's hope this guy fits because I, otherwise I did, who do we have? <laughs> I, I didn't ask, but um, you know, there were some very fine musicians there, including another keyboard player that used to play. I forget his name, Peter, Peter Primrose, maybe phenomenal jazz pianist. Um, and, you know, he came up to me afterwards and told me, you know, I just captured it perfectly. So I was very honored to hear that. Mm. But, yeah, that's how that happened. <laughs> well, that's, it's you like, know, we, oh. we we say on this show all the time, always be performing. And, and it's become our catchphrase. But that speaks to why that can be so important, because you never know what the no. stakes are for what you're playing at that moment. And for you, this was, I mean, clearly this was an audition for the band. They didn't tell you before the gig that Pete had quit. They waited until after the gig to tell you Pete had quit. No, they did not. They did not tell me. <laughs> Amazing. I, and, I found you know, out I joined a band once because I was subbing for their drummer. I found out middle of the second of three sets, they announced to the crowd, oh, this is our new drummer, Dave, our, our, our Scott quit. And I'm like, hello? Like, can, should we compare calendars? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, David, I got a really interesting question for you. So we recently had a conversation about the relationship between cover musicians, including tribute musicians, and original music musicians, and, and that there often exists a, um, a, a slight line of tension in many markets where the original music musicians kind of look down on cover musicians. Now, you are playing with, a-list guys playing, a, you know, a form of cover music. I just wonder if you had any thoughts about the reflection to that type of thing. Is it is it a gig is a gig and music is music, or is it, or do you feel any part of what you do is you'd rather be doing original music, or would any of the other guys, you know, look at it that way, or is it like you know we love what we're playing and we're playing what we want to play? So great question. So uh, first of all, yeah, I love playing the music. Uh, in fact, to be honest, some of it I love playing it more than I like listening to it. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, for example, I'm not a Pink Floyd fan. And in fact, I turned down the offer to join that band the first time they asked me because I asked eh, Pink Floyd, they're, they're a blues band with sound effects. Um, that was my perspective. <laughs> That's uh, not but, incorrect, uh, but you know, yeah. I, I understand, <laughs> but, but, it, but it's an absolute blast performing that music and playing yeah. it and challenging, especially when you're trying to do the albums with just one keyboard player, for example, oh, but, they, but that band has two guitarists. They're a phenomenal band. Um, but to answer that question. So I went through the phase where you got to play this note for note. You know, if you're doing a Genesis song, you know, if you're doing first or fifth, you'd better get that solo dead on. You don't get to do an imp improvise and so on. And then actually, after joining Security Project, Trey pushed me, and it was a hard push. And I was very uncomfortable. It was outside my comfort zone for, for quite a while. He said, we can reimagine this. And in fact, they deliberately got a female singer so mm -hmm. that nobody could basically say, uh, do the comparison with Peter Gabriel. And we, and yeah, think about that. Smart. Uh, That's yeah, really and, smart. Of course, yeah, this is I, coming from Trey Gunn. So he's got some street yeah, cred to, to make yeah, this decision. I, 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 absolutely. Um, and so uh, uh, um, well, I learned, you know, yeah, I don't have to use the same string machine as Larry Fast used. Um, you know, I don't have to use the same organ settings. And in fact, you know, I like to still try and play the same chords because to me that that counts. But, you, you know, you don't have to do the same. If there's a signature solo, like in the Pink Floyd band with which I play, you know, some of those solos are really signature. You have to do them pretty much the same way or every or, you know, it just it's it's part of the song. It's not an it, improv. Yeah, it's 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 more of a melody than a solo. Yeah. yeah. But but the other side of it is and I think I have two. My two favorite examples, because that we get I, we get pushback on that one sometimes. I've had people, you know, comment anonymously on 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 the internet because everybody just says whatever the hell they want to say. Um, and I'll say two things. He said, number one, you know, Bruce Springsteen had a song called "Blinded by the Light." Yeah. But if I mentioned "Blinded by the Light," who do you think of? Well, you're asking the wrong guy. Paul is, yeah. is like the world's biggest Springsteen fan. But of course, Manfred Mann, right, is who you right. think of for that exactly. song. Exactly. Right. A completely different, but an amazing version. 
Totally. Uh, um, then my other favorite example is Pictures at an Exhibition, mm. Great Piece of Music. Great record. I, my, I was first introduced to it through the ELP album. Yeah. But I've heard the piano-only version. I've heard the orchestral version. Tamita did it on synthesizers. And he, his version is brilliant. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, um, the, the one about the, the chickens, he actually uses chicken sounds. Um, and there's a, I forget his name, but there's a Japanese guitarist who does the entire pictures at an exhibition on a guitar. Really? Uh, oh, it's phenomenal. He also has one, he did uh, Dvorak from the New World. Mm. They're phenomenal. I'll find you the name and send it to you. I have sure. the fab. So they're completely different interpretations. Is one better than the other? Um, meh, you know, depending on the mood you're in. Sure. You, you know, so, so. Yeah, yeah that's cover, that, that, that can be said about a lot of things that ELP, you know, covered in, in their career. A lot of the, the classical stuff. It's like they're, they're, they're two completely different takes on the same work. And there's, there's thousands of takes on these works. So, yeah. Well, first of all, everything uh, around classical music is a cover. That's correct. Original, uh, you, <laughs> That's why I, I'm right? kind of using air quotes when I say they covered <laughs> pictures at an exhibition. Yeah. I mean, it, they technically did, but we don't think of that as a cover. We just think of that as them playing a classical piece, <laughs> which, right, which is a cover. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, 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 I th you know, if you're trying to be a tribute band, then I guess you're you're trying to play it exactly the same way. And there's an audience for that. Uh, you know, people grew up with it. I want to hear exactly what I heard. Sure. So you take a band like the Musical Box, uh, you know, and they're doing, you know, they're doing the Genesis music. But, you know, the guitarist is sitting down like Steve Hackett did. There's a guy yeah. running around with all the costumes um, you know, the keyboard players using the Mellotron, you know, they're, they're doing at that level. Sure. Um, you know, I'm perfectly happy if I play a Genesis song, I'll use the Mtron Pro, uh, Pro from GeForce plugin. Sounds just as good to me. And it's a hell of a lot lighter. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, so, so, um, you know, security project was really reimagining, uh, Gabriel's music. They did a lot of interpretation tray, you know, changed a lot of the way he did some of the stuff. I mean, it's pretty remarkable, yep. but, you know, we did it different. Um, we used to do Biko, and, you know, in the in the original, uh, we had a male singer for a while, and we used to do Biko, and in the original, you know, the solo, da 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 um, um, uh, sorry, I don't know, phones aren't... Phones sorry. make noise. It's how it goes. I forgot to put Do Not Disturb on, um... I can remember how to do Dave that. Dave can help that's you with that if you need some help. Right. <laughs> I know a guy well. that's, uh, <laughs> that, that, yeah, that might be good at that stuff. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Um, I forgot where I, where I was. You were I'll playing Biko. Oh, Biko. And so, um, you know, when they did the solo, da, 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 you know, they, they had this kind of um, sawtooth string sound. Yeah. So I was using contact um, and I, I got a, a great bagpipe um, plug in uh, or, or instrument for it, which of course bagpipes sound a little bit out of tune. And so I, I basically loaded it twice and detuned them against each other. And you get up there with the Eigen harp, these do this with the Eigen harp. And when it comes to the soul and you just blast it out, it's so unexpected. Um, you know, yeah. um, did we do it exactly the same way? No, we didn't. But you know what? It works. That's cool. So, so, so I think what you're, so, what you're yeah, saying to us. For it. What you're saying to us is that uh, even playing with musicians who have played and created some of the most amazing original music in the world, there's quite a bit of artistic latitude to going back and, and playing great songs and finding joy in doing that. It, I, I'm not hearing any note of snobbery that that original musicians look down on covering classical music aside, even in popular music and rock music, that original music, it's music. And I if you can, can make it beautiful, it's beautiful. I can only speak to the musicians I know. I, Fair mean, I don't know what other um, people think. I would think, or I would hope, that most musicians would be flattered that other people want to play their music. Oh, absolutely. I don't think it's. I don't think it's the cover er and cover e. I think it's people who have original music, who are trying to make a life in original music, have an opinion about. 
Always. cover musicians I, I taking think, up space. Yeah, I think we're giving this more airtime than it needs. We talked about this a couple of episodes ago. Paul ran into somebody that that was exactly as you describe, of course, that, you know, had this level of snobbery. I've not run into that in a great degree. Well, you saw what the guy from uh, Pork Tornadoes said. He said, you know, that the Iowa scene was, you know, packed with an almost hostile vibe between original musicians feeling the cover musicians were taking up their space. Interesting. Yeah. I, I don't find that to be a universal thing. Um, I mean, I and certainly, I think, I, I think the great line that he came back was that they should just write better original music. Well, that's the thing, right? Like, like, like you know, good, original bands with good music do very well, uh, but you have to promote yourself. I mean, it's like anything, you know, it's like Fair. starting any business. Yeah, exactly. And, Fair. and it's much harder than it used to be because it's so yeah. easy uh, you know, the problem is it's so easy to make music, um, but of course, making great music is not so easy, but oh, there's yeah. so much stuff out there that's very difficult to find good stuff anymore. Yeah, well, they, they, I'm they, give they, you... there's a lot of signal and a lot of noise is the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, David, I'll just, just for pure fun, for a guy who's not a Pink Floyd fan, what's your favorite Pink Floyd tune that you play? Uh, to actually play, um, probably Sheep. Nice. Really? Uh, um, sheep is a lot of fun because you know there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, there's a couple of songs I do with the Eigen Harp. Um, 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 so at the beginning of Shine, you know, mm. we do the whole I do, you know, which is kind of cool. Yeah, uh, Sheep is probably kind of the most interesting. Sheep and Dogs, th those ones are are um, kind of fun. Um, th they're challenging. There's a lot of moving parts. Very cool. Uh, in, in in those songs, That's love cool. it. And of course. They're kind of more progressive than some of the other ones. So that may be a part of. Totally. You know. So, yeah. okay. But so, I end up having to do. Yeah, sorry. Go no, ahead. No, no. I, I, I want to hear all your stories. And that's what I was going to ask you about is you, you mentioned how you fell into this scene by getting to know Jerry Murata somehow. How, how did. Be, <laughs> and I want to ask how that happened. Not that it's a replicatable thing, but this is. This is how these things happen. What you're about to tell us is how these things happen. It's happenstance, right? And and then suddenly you have access and you are in a different world if you can hang. And and that's yeah. it, you know. Yeah. So 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 you know the it's always the case. I mean, I could argue that about how I ended up in the US working for one of the great research companies in the world. You know, you got to you got to be prepared. You got to get the breaks. Yes. And then you've got to be able to prove yourself. Yes. Um, so, so what happened um, with Security Project, um, I was trying to get back into playing in bands um, um, about 12, 15 years ago, because uh, it's something I hadn't done like since I was a teenager. And, and I'd been playing in a few, and I was playing in a band with a guy called Scott Weinberger, who you may have heard of, he actually, um, he's got a couple of TV shows. He's a producer and he's got a couple of TV shows. Anyway, he's a very, very good um, drummer and majorly into bands like Genesis, King Crimson and, and so on. Okay. And we got together and we started playing a few of those kinds of songs and, you know, just for fun. I mean, it never really went anywhere. But uh, it turns out um, Scott knew... Trey and Jerry. I don't know how, but he he knew them sure. probably because he was just more connected. And he had this idea to create a band to celebrate. Um, I think it was thirty years since the release of the Security Project. Uh, uh, the, the Security, the album Security. Yeah. And he was just talking to me just as a friend. He says, you know, do I think it'd be a good idea? I, you know, uh, and believe it or not, I wasn't a great Peter Gabriel fan either. I loved the Genesis stuff, but I didn't like the early albums. I never listened to them that much. I know. What what can I say? That, no, that's how it uh, works. Yeah, that's yeah. how it goes. So, yeah. so I thought, yeah, sure, great. Anyway, he had found a band, another Genesis tribute band. Um, I think they were in Rochester. And... Uh, they, they were going to use um, their singer, who sounded like Gabriel, and their keyboard player. Then about a month before they were going to do the first attempt to make this thing work to see if it was viable, uh, that keyboard player apparently said he wouldn't be able to do the, the thing because it was some family stuff going on. I don't know if his wife was pregnant or there was, there was something going on. So Scott basically said to me, would I be interested in doing this? Uh, and I'm kind of 
thinking, hmm, yeah, that'd be a great candidate. I'd love to have a go. Now, I have to tell you, um, I wouldn't have had the courage to do that. Yeah. Had I not had um, about a year earlier, I had a chance to play with Patrick Moraz. That's another story. Whoa. Yeah. Um, so I knew Patrick Moraz. I met him uh, when I was at IBM Research. I ran a computer music group and I had a budget for lunchtime concerts. And we used to get people who were basically on the, you know, these on the edge. They were doing new stuff. Like we had Max Matthews came, if you know Max. Yeah. Max, you know, Max, Max is named after Max Matthews. Did a lot of pioneering work with the conductor and various other uh, things. And we had quite a few very, very famous people come in and play. Um, and Keyboard Magazine had an article about how musicians were going around doing shows, you know, and, uh, groups of people would like get a 20 or 30 of their friends collect enough money to basically pay yeah. for like a house, you know, like a house show or whatever house. Yeah, concerts. House show. yeah. And Patrick Moraz was doing these. And so um, I reached out to him from IBM and said, Hey, you know, uh, would you be willing to come in and do a lunchtime concert? And, you know, he kind of, um, I didn't get to him. I got to his manager first and the manager said, to say, wouldn't be that interested. I said, look, tell him, you know, this IBM research, we've got a lot of interesting people here. He might enjoy it. Anyway, Cut a long story short, he came in, did the show, had a great time, um, um, and we, we got to know him. Uh, he actually stayed with us, so we became friends. And then um, he saw a YouTube video of me demonstrating the Eigenharp. I was doing um, a couple of songs from Riverdance on the Eigenharp. And he invited me to come and perform with him. He was doing a show in New Jersey. He said, would I come and just play one song? I'm like, no freaking way like what i have to do to do that <laughs> yeah my, da my daughter who was very young at the time um said to me basically dad you gotta do it yeah. you know i mean talk about a young kid having you gotta do it yeah so I she was right yeah she was uh, i got up the courage i took my and harp to new jersey I did did a song with them, made it made a ton of mistakes. That's a whole different story, but you know, mistakes um, are how we learn. Like that's well, that's just yeah, how it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a story on that too from Larry <laughs> Fast, but that's another day. Uh, anyway, so I was kind of buoyed by that ex experience when this thing came out. I said, "Sure, I can do it." So I learned four songs. Um, I forget which ones for the, for this kind of audition thing, and I showed up in in. Um, in um, Dreamland, which is um, Jerry Murata's recording studio up in, in um, Woodstock, Woodstock yeah. near Woodstock. And Trey was there. Uh, Jerry was there. Sid McGuinness was there. Oh, my gosh. The yeah, you know. And uh, so, you know, we're doing these songs. It was, and it was very interesting. I, I'm totally intimidated. You know, I mean. As, as you amateur, should be. Right. I'm, I'm this amateur player. And it's like, you know, got all these. Anyway, so the first thing that happens is Trey comes over to me. And he says, what's the chord that you play at this particular point? He wasn't, you know. And, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm telling Trey the chords? This is, you know, anyway, that was kind of, I just remember that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so we did these, we did a bunch of songs and, um, you know, worked out very well. Um, apparently they were, Trey, they were a little worried about whether, how I would be in the road since I had no experience. That's a, that's a really interesting thing. Yeah. Being able well, to play and being I, able to I, detach enough to be on the road. That's a very different thing. Yeah. Well, I, I got a story about that, too, because I didn't understand what they meant at the time. So I'm just going, sure, I could do that. Not a problem. <laughs> Never having really gone on the road. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, so we did our first show um, in B.B. King's yeah. uh, in New York City when it was still there. You know, I mean, it was a blast. It was it was a lot. It was a lot of fun. Then we started doing a few tours and then we ended up setting up this tour in Europe. And for that tour, we got to live on a tour bus for a month. Now, I had no experience with this stuff. And in fact, uh, a person um, that I met um, from a band called The Fix, 
Yeah. Uh, his name was Rupert. Um, he was a friend of Jerry's. Is that he Rupert Hines? Thought, um, God, I can't remember his, uh, I can't, I'm, I can't remember his, um, first name. Uh, come back to me in a moment because I think um, it was, I think that was Rupert Hine, right? Was, was, he was the producer for the fix. Maybe he wasn't no, in the band. Maybe I'm, I'm con- Rupert, Ru, 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 Rupert Greenall. I'm conflating the two. It doesn't matter. No, Ru, yeah. Ru, Rupert Greenall. He, he was a keyboard player. Got it. So he said, he said to me, so they showed up for a show in New York city um, and I said, can I look inside your coach? So he brought me inside. And then he said, I'll give you some advice. Make sure you pick the center bed. If there's three beds I said, why? He said, well, if you sleep in the bottom bed, you're going to have a lot of road noise from the wheels because you're too low down. If you're on the top one, then you're going to be swaying all over the place because the top of the bus. Yeah. <laughs> so he says, pick the center one. So, um, so yeah, so when we started the tour in Europe, I get into this bus and I very quickly went and picked a, <laughs> a center berth. So I'd like lying in there and you could barely fit. Yeah. You don't want to be, you know. And so the first thing somebody says is you need to face the other way. Yeah, in case the bus stops short. That's right. I, yeah, I can't say why. He says, well, if the bus stops suddenly. So I'm like thinking, hmm. Yeah, you, Meanwhile, you want your feet going forward. Over the, you want your feet going forward, folks. Yeah, because you don't want your head to hit if the bus stops yeah, short. Mean, yeah. Meanwhile, our driver is driving through snow in the Swiss Alps at about 70 miles an hour while we're asleep. Which I, you know, so uh, that, that, was a, that was an experience. Um, the best part was, you know, we're all older, right? Right. You know, I mean, at the time of this, which was like, I think, 2014, so that's like six, you know, so I was in my middle 50s, you know, Jerry, you know, everyone's in their ballpark in their fifties or, or, no, or nobody's in their twenties. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so everybody's snoring. <laughs> so Trey, and, 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 oh yeah. So Scott, Scott Weinberger, Joy, Joy, who, you know, was a, kind of helping with tour managing thing, you know, shows up, he gets to, on the, co- on the tour for a couple of days. He stays on the bus with us. And he's like bitching about everybody snoring. I don't blame him. And Trey wrote this amazing blog article, and he referred to the Snorkestra. Uh. <laughs> uh, and it, I don't say I don't know if his blog is still there, but it was absolutely hysterical. It's, it's just like you're lying there, and it's just like eight or nine people just snoring all around you. Did it keep you up? I started taking an Ambien every night. Said, Screw <laughs> this! I, I'm, Smart I'm man. Just, yeah, I'm so just smart. knocking myself out. Um, yeah. I'm just going going to sleep. That's so. But, smart. It, but it was very it was very funny. That's outstanding. Okay, so uh, thank you. Like this is this is amazing. You um you have a lot of stories. We could do this for a couple of hours. I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of. Well, there's two things I want to highlight here. First of all, your break happened tangentially because of your day job, right? If it if it weren't for that. That that progression of you playing with Patrick Moraz because you hired him, you met him because you hired him to play at, at IBM. Like that, you know, that, this may well, or may not have we we may not be having this conversation. Or well, I mean, you know, that's the classic for want of a penny, the kingdom was lost. That's it. That's uh, right. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's easy to look at that if you're going backwards. Correct. It's not so easy to look at that from what should I do now? Well, that and that's why, you know, um, my advice to everybody is take every opportunity you can and just play with oh, yeah. people and oh, and and oh, let yeah. it and, and, you know, be able to show up and hang and don't be a dick. Uh, if you can avoid it, I have trouble with that. But you know, if if, if oh, most other people, it, you know, but that's I've got more, I've got more stories. <laughs> but but like this, this is this is how this stuff happens. You, you didn't set out to become the go-to guy for the tri-state area's uh, top tribute bands, right? Like the, 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 no one, no one paves that path because that, that would be crazy to say that. And, and so, but yet that's who you are now, but it all happened because you were a nerd with a day job uh, or math nerd with a day job, right? Like that's how, that's how that worked. But math nerd with a day job that knows how to program and is a keyboard player winds up making a piece of software called gig performer. 
Right. And so I want you to tell us, so gig performer is something, you are a keyboard player and it clearly is for keyboard players, but also for guitar players and, and lots of other people too. Oh so yeah. Tell us what gig performer is. Okay. So first I should tell you how it came about. Sure. If, if, if this time. Um, so again, um, you know, I went through and probably every keyboard player went through what I call the Rick Wakeman stage. Right. So surrounded by name, the keyboard, you know, what what does Paul say? Wearing a cape. (laughs) Pardon? Wearing a cape. I didn't wear the cape, um, <laughs> but but uh, um, nor the cross, but the <laughs> but but the rest of it, you know, you know, yeah, you know, I, I've got the road, I got the piano, I got the moog, you got the prophet, I have the, the you know, and you're surrounded by this thing. You it got more crap years. than the drummer to bring in the room. Yeah, but they, it took me years to realize that nobody gave a damn about that, other than you. Other than me, right? Um, it, it took it took me years. Um, so so what happened was um, I had started using main stage, okay, uh, which I at the when it came out, what a brilliant idea! They, they did some things absolutely fabulously. Yeah, and I started using it to control all my hardware at the time. I wasn't hadn't really started using plugins yet. Um, and then I started having some problems with it. Um, and I had also been using Max from Cycling 74, which if you're familiar with it, which is a piece of software that I've been using for many, many years. Um, it's an absolutely brilliant uh, piece of software when Miller Puckett originally invented it. And what I ended up doing was I ended up rebuilding my entire live setup with Max. In fact, there's some blog articles, I think they're still around how I did it. And so I had this live thing. There was like a, there was an area where I'd have like six slots for plugins and two more slots for effects. And then I had sliders and I could route anything to anything and so on. And I could set up all my MIDI processing to do all the tricks that I needed to do. And I built that and I was using that with security project and with beyond the wall for a while. Got it. What happened was um, I started running into some limits uh, and I couldn't really get any help getting it resolved. Uh, for whatever reason, as as Max itself evolved, uh, I was having more and more problems with it. So my development partner, uh, with whom I've done various other projects over the last uh, 15 years or so, and he's a guitar player, which talks back to why gig performer is aimed just as much as sure. guitar players as is keyboard players. Got it. He and I talked about it. We looked at a couple of other products that were out there because we didn't really want to get into that game. Um, I'm not going to mention any names, but there was one where uh, it's like, you know, I got a PhD in computer science. I couldn't figure out how to um, how to insert a plugin into, mm. the, into that yeah. program. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah no, know, this wasn't uh, easy. Yeah. I couldn't couldn't I couldn't figure out how to do it. Now maybe go off and read the manual, blah, 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 but I, I didn't. So we decided let's do our own. And then we decided, you know, let's forget about channel strips. Let's think about this from a musician's standpoint where they don't have to be technical. You shouldn't need a PhD in mix engineering to be able to create your own sounds. You know, you shouldn't have to learn about buses and oxes and channels, insert this here, send this here, and, and all that kind of stuff to make your sound. So that's why we went the visual route. So in Gig Performer, you know, your plugins, you just connect them together. Um, you want you want the sound going to here and to here and to here? Yeah, just connect it from here to here and to here, and just works. And our big focus at the time was when you get up on stage, don't be worried that if you push this button or move that slider that your software is going to crash. We were very concerned about stability on stage. You know, if it crashed when you were editing and working in your studio, just preparing from time to time, that doesn't really happen anymore. But it used to. That, that's far more tolerable than pushing a button on stage and getting no sound or yeah, so, awful so sound. And I have yeah. to say, I, um, Gig Performer, since I started using it on stage, uh, it never crashed once. I mean, it was just, 
just rock solid and you know on stage would just work you know you could get some errant plugins that could bring down the system but you know if you rehearse and you test everything out first you discover those yeah. um and so that was a huge thing and we learned you know music you know you show up at sound check somebody hands you a different keyboard oh god i gotta make the knobs work so we came up with the rig manager which makes it really easy to remap uh the knobs on your keyboard um if they send out different midi messages than your old one yeah so you i want to i want to point something out here and this is very hard to do this is an audio show and we're doing this one audio i i almost feel like to explain gig performer you need to see it visually but when you were showing me gig performer all those knobs that you can have on your midi keyboard can be mapped to anything that you want them to be in your in gig performer so you can change all of your uh you know a, a great example is the draw bars for a Hammond organ you want to adjust those great you assign your midi uh it could be your midi draw bars but it could also be midi knobs to those things or even just midi buttons to pull up different sets of those or different configurations of those and it's just there and what you're telling me is if i show up with a different keyboard and i know that i have all of these things plugged in I can go in quickly and say, let's remap those presets to these presets. No, to these you don't buttons. have to map. You don't have to map, map the presets. That's okay. the thing. So here's the thing. So we have widgets, which is our generic term for knobs and buttons and sliders. Fair enough. Okay. So, and by the way, this is what main stage did this. And I give them major um, credit for doing this. They made this separation between MIDI messages and controlling parameters. So the idea is instead of knowing I've got a plugin and it needs MIDI CC27, you basically, you would attach, uh, you take a knob and you'd attach it maybe to MIDI 27 on your keyboard, but then the knob is attached to the parameter of the plugin. And so you, you don't really care what MIDI control you're using. It doesn't matter. Now, so that separation, that's something that Mainstage did. I think um, actually Motu's performer, the sequencer, did it first, but not quite as elegantly, but they did it too. Uh, and that was brilliant. So we, we have this concept. You take a widget and you can click on the widget, you associate it with a parameter. Okay. Yep. But then on the other side, you say to this widget, learn the knob that I'm turning. And, uh, on my keyboard, and 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 now the widget knows my physical knob, but that MIDI message, whatever it is, I don't even. Yeah, care you don't. What it you is. you as the user have no idea what MIDI message it's sending. It doesn't right. matter. Now here's, yeah. now here's the thing: in your different rack spaces, when you're creating all your knobs to control whatever parameters you want in particular plugins, instead of basically learning each time, you basically you use a rig manager and you give your knobs name. Trivial, it might be knob one, knob two, knob three, knob four. Now, what you do is in every one of your rack spaces, you, you have knob one, you'll name it, attach that to the filter cutoff. Knob two, maybe it's a, a balance. Knob three, it's an attack, mm. for example. Now, you go to a show and somebody hands you a different keyboard that's got a bunch of, uh, of, um, of controls. Instead of trying to reprogram those things help the manual how do i change the cc message of this keyboard sure factory reset it if you know how to do just at least that or whatever basically go to the rig manager select knob one actually just double click on the name knob one turn the knob and now whatever that message is will now be now will work everywhere that wanted knob one will just work so by abstracting it out you make the the reassigning almost yeah. trivial yeah. So you can be in the sound check. And again, this is where, you know, I've been to sound checks. We've had three hours to prepare. And I've been at sound checks where the audience is standing at the door. That's right. You know, and it's yeah. like, yeah. So the idea here is I need to be able to do this in 30 seconds. And you, and you can. And, that's and so that's the musician side of what, what does a musician who's up there in stage, what do they need to be able to do yeah. to get on? You know, and so there's a lot of stuff like that. Um, to make it easier. 
No, that makes uh, it makes perfect. That makes sense. I expect, and I, my guess is it will make more sense to people that are fighting this battle than people that have never fought this battle. Uh, but I, I appreciate you going through at least that part of it, audio, audio with an audio only description, a, a, a verbal only description. So this is this is fantastic. So uh, I was going to ask where we can see you next, and but of course we know because you told us right out the gate that we can Carol see you House, May May sixteenth. That's great. That's I, I. I think if you do a Google search, it probably comes up, and you can you can live stream it for free. Um, and I guess that means I'd better really make sure I've learned the music again. I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you've got I don't know a month to to relearn this stuff. So you know you got yeah, some time. I got nothing else to do. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And it's not it's not like it's your first gig with this band. But if it was. You know, you'd be able to play it without a sound check. So we, we know that too. Thank you. It's a bit different. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing all these stories with us. Thank you for telling us about gig performance. Thanks just for coming on the show. I definitely want to have you back. Um, we are we are short on time today, but um, but you clearly have more stories that we want to hear. And I know our listeners are going to want to hear too. So I'd love to I'd love to bring you back, uh, you know, in a few months and, and dig deeper into and, some of this time. stuff. Awesome. Great where fun. where can people find you and find out about Gig Performer and all of that good stuff? Uh, gig Performer, they can find out just gigperformer.com. Okay. Um, um, the the bands beyondthewall.net. Okay. It, it's, it's, I, I don't think that gets updated that much, but it's there. Um, securityprojectband.com. Yeah. Um, and reeling in the years. Band. I don't, I'm not sure I know the URL. We'll, we'll find, I, I, we'll we'll find, find it. it. I think it's real in the years band.com, but we'll put all this stuff in the show notes. This is yeah. so great, yeah. man. So great. Well, thank you again for coming on the show and, uh, and telling us all this stuff. I love, I loved your stories. This is great so stories. Yeah. Uh, I, I appreciate your inviting me. Thank of course. You. And we, we definitely want to have you back for sure. Yeah. Happy to. Thanks for listening, folks. If you want to email us, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Thanks, thanks, David. What's that yeah, thing we thanks. say? Hey, David, why don't you say it? Always be performing. Always be performing. Yeah.